late yesterday, an allegation of sexual assault surfaced against Lieutenant Governor Justice Fa Justin Fairfax. A woman claimed he sexually assaulted her in the 2004 Democratic National Convention in Boston. Fairfax put out a statement at 2.55 a.m. this morning denying it. And late this afternoon, he held an impromptu news conference at the Virginia Capitol building and said these allegations were timed to smear him as he may become Virginia's governor if Governor Ralph Northam resigns. Uh, and my family uh, is strong. Uh, my faith is incredibly strong. Uh, my faith in God uh, is unshaken. Uh, we will not only deal with this uh, smear as we've dealt with so many other attacks over time, uh, but we've always, uh, when we've been attacked, uh, been elevated. Uh, every single time someone is attacked, whether it's a lie, uh, whether it's a smear, a political attack, a personal attack, a character attack, a character assassination attempt, uh, we've always not only gotten through it, but we have been elevated. Uh, and I, my faith in God is so strong, uh, and I know uh, that the facts uh, will show exactly uh, what we have borne out. How would, you describe the relationship? How would you describe the relationship? What, what Which, was what the relationship? relationship? What relationship? With this woman? That was, with this woman? Uh, it's someone who I met uh, in 2004 uh, at the Democratic uh, National Convention. And as I mentioned, uh, I told all this to the Washington Post at the time, uh, a year ago. Uh, and there's not one fact uh, that I gave to them uh, that they were able to contradict. Can you tell us what happened? Uh, what is it? Sure. Sure. I met her uh, at the convention. Uh, we met and uh, you know, talked. And I did not know her prior to. Um, I was 25 years old, unmarried. Uh, a campaign staffer uh, at the time, and uh, we hit it off. She was uh, you know, very interested in me, and uh, and so eventually at one point uh, we ended, ended up going uh, to uh, my hotel room. Uh, this is in 2004. Uh, she was, you know, very uh, much into um, you know, consensual encounter, and she even admits in the story there's a uh, consensual uh, activity going on. And again, I have children, so I'm going to be very circumspect uh, about what I say. Um, but but everything was 100% consensual, and not only that. Uh, the same uh, person uh, called me uh, sometime later and wanted to meet with me, wanted to come visit me. Uh, I was still in law school at Columbia Law School, wanted to come to New York City to meet with me, wanted me to meet her mother, uh, and said that years later, and, uh, I'm sorry, months later in this case, uh, and years later now, uh, we have a totally fabricated story uh, out of the blue that's meant to attack me uh, because of where I am in politics. The fact that it only came uh, up once I won. Uh, and remember, I have run for office before. Uh, I ran in 2013 in a primary statewide. Uh, I ran in 2017 in a primary statewide. Uh, I ran, of course, in the general and won. It was only at the point uh, that I won uh, that this person uh, fabricates this claim uh, and then attempts to, again, get it into the media. And when they fail the first time uh, to get it into the media, uh, comes back around uh, a year later at another point of maximum media attention and once again tries to get it in uh, through uh, you know, some website and some people who we know who are uh, involved in this. And so no one who is telling the truth operates in that way. Uh, I have nothing to hide, and, and yet to have someone manipulate the media, if you were telling the truth, there's no reason that you would go away for a year once you fail to get it into the Washington Post uh, and then come back later again with zero cooperation whatsoever, and there's no cooperation because that did not happen. Our collective well, PACs are collective PAC. They said that... Uh, you believe that the governor's team is spreading misinformation about your team. Can you comment on that, please, sir? Uh, the collective pack has you know, made its statement, uh, and so you believe it. Do you, uh, you know, I, I don't know uh, precisely where this is coming from. I, you know, we've heard uh, different things, but but here's the thing: uh, Does anybody think it's any coincidence that on the eve? Uh, of potentially uh, my being elevated, that that's when this uncorroborated smear comes out. Does anybody believe that's a coincidence? Uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody believes that's a coincidence. Again, particularly with something, this was not the first time this was uh, brought up. It was a year ago uh, this was brought up. Uh, you know, and, and yet, the Post who investigated it for three months dropped the story, did not do it, and they did not do it because it was uncorroborated, and it's uncorroborated because it's not true. And so it goes away uh, for a year, and it crops back up right at this moment. Uh, you don't have to be uh, cynical, uh, you don't have to understand politics uh, to understand when someone's trying to manipulate uh, a process to, uh, to harm someone's character without any basis whatsoever. Uh, and again, uh, I have lived my life uh, in, in, in a way that I'm proud of. Uh, I've put myself up for election to the people of Commonwealth of Virginia multiple times. Uh, you never in the course of any campaign I have ever run uh, had anything uh, said uh, like this uh, about me. Uh, and again, I'm someone who uh, grew up uh, in, a, in a tough environment, Northeast Washington, D.C., uh, but because people invested in me, I went to Duke University, Columbia Law School. I was in the Law Review of Columbia. Uh, I was a federal prosecutor. I have been through two FBI background checks in my life. I got a top secret security clearance, uh, and I've been an attorney, a federal prosecutor. Uh, and now I'm a, a partner in a law firm and sitting as the lieutenant governor of the Commonwealth this, of Virginia. Can you
uh, take no note, that's how you communicate clearly during a press conference. So as you heard, Lieutenant Governor Fairfax was asked about the Collective PAC and joined us. Uh, joining us is Quentin James, co-founder of the Collective PAC, an organization that supports black candidates, and Philip Thompson, uh, the president of the Loudoun County NAACP. Let's first go to Quentin. How are you doing this evening, Quentin? I'm good. Thank you so much for, for having me. And uh, it's been a wild 72 hours. Oh, I can only imagine. Thanks so much for joining us. So I think I'll start off with that last point that was raised in the press conference. Could you tell us more about this allegation that perhaps this specific uh, sexual assault allegation has creeped back up as a result of the Northam side of the political um, aisle? Yeah, so uh, listen, we were tipped off uh, on late Saturday evening and early Sunday morning uh, about an attempted whisper campaign from uh, the, the Northam team. Now, we don't know who on his team uh, was doing this, but they were raising questions about Justin's age and readiness uh, to serve as governor should Governor Northam resign. Um, that came out about 2.30 p.m. on Sunday, uh, but also because we know where the original picture came from. On Friday, uh, we were very worried about, or wary, excuse me, about uh, a white supremacist blog obviously not wanting to see an uh, African-American uh, like Justin Fairfax become a successful governor of Virginia. And so we put, uh, you know, a call out to folks to uh, be ready um, for any lies, uh, any uh, other distractions that would have you know, been coming out. And little to our knowledge, at midnight uh, on uh, Sunday uh, evening and, and, and Monday morning, uh, that same white supremacist blog uh, releases a Facebook post from uh, the accuser, which was shared to them um, by what we are investigating, what we believe to be uh, a very prominent and public uh, Democratic and liberal uh, couple um, from the Richmond area. And so we are unsure uh, who they are connected to. We know that uh, the woman who shared the accuser's Facebook post is uh, the wife of a uh, professor at the University of Richmond who also uh, worked for uh, two Democratic mayors in Richmond um, over the past few years. And so there is some concern around why would uh, this reputable uh, couple uh, use this situation, right, this potential Me Too situation, and go to a white supremacist news outlet or blog with that information and not the Post or not the Times or many of the other reputable news sources. Mm -hmm. uh, come mm -hmm. to find out at 3 a.m., uh, you know, yesterday that this went to the Post and they decided that it couldn't be corroborated, so they didn't uh, publish it. So now this is all kind of you know, getting out there, conservative media is jumping all over it. But we have a lot of questions about where did this come from um, and, and who is kind of manipulating this process behind the scenes using uh, the veil of this white supremacist blog as like them breaking this news. And that's not where it came from. So we're that's looking a, into that. That's a very important question I and mean, a very good question. Uh, I want to bring in Philip on this. Uh, what's your thoughts about where this came from? Does it seem plausible that this would have come from Democrats who are in, in essence trying to protect Northam? Well, you know, it, it, the delay process, if you look at how this all happened, he was going to resign and, and have indications. And then all of a sudden he has this meeting with these operatives of his and they start delaying. Mm -hmm. And as they delay, then this comes out. So it's a, it's a perfect tactic to try to delay the, what's going on with you and then let this other stuff come out. And where, if it's messy enough, then either everybody will say, oh, well, let's just leave it alone. Absolutely. And you're sort of seeing that now with, with, with some of the people in the House saying, oh, we're not, there's no stomach for, for, for impeaching him and all these various things. So mm -hmm. now it's gotten a little bit messy. If before, if it was just Justin in this clean slate, I think, I think things would have went a lot different. Yeah, I mean, when I think back even to the campaign, for example, I ha I'm a Virginia resident. I, I happen to remember the controversy about the Northam campaign basically copying some Democratic Party literature. The literature was copied word for word. It included a picture of Northam. It included a picture of uh, Fairfax. It included a, a picture of the attorney general candidate at the time, who's also white, right? But somehow, when Northam's campaign got a hold of it, the black guy's picture got erased. I mean, do, are we seeing some consistency here? Yeah, you know, we were ready for that. Uh, those of us work closely with Justin, and that's why I ended up in the Washington Post and New York Times really quick, hit them hard. They then jumped away from that. So, 
you're starting to see the impact of that of that same type of technique. You know, Virginia is, you know, as I as I said, Virginia politics, especially Democrat politics, is somewhat of a plantation. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to preside on this plantation, but you're not going to you're not going to get to the big house. Either. That's the way they try to handle it. And in this situation, they are staring at the precipice of having a 39 year old man become a, a potentially a governor for six years. And for some people, that's that's probably untenable. I hear you. So joining us on the panel today to talk about this and more is Joseph Williams, senior editor for U.S. News and World Reports, Michael Brown, former vice chair of the DNC Finance Committee, and of course Eugene Craig of the of X Factor Strategies. Yes. <laughs> so welcome. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Great to have you on the panel. So first, I'd love your views on this. What do you think is going on here? Are, are we sort of being too conspiratorial when we talk about, hey, maybe this is coming from the Democrats? It's hard to be too conspiratorial when you're talking about Virginia politics for the reasons you just said. I mean, um, I'm old enough to remember when Doug Wilder was uh, elected yep. in, uh, in the 80s. And on the eve of his election, when it looked like he had scored a clear victory, all of a sudden there was a recount. All of a sudden there were problems. There were uh, malfunctions with Machine X or Machine Y. This precinct wasn't counted accurately. So it's not surprising at all. What is interesting is that it's coming from the left, ostensibly. And there's been a lot of discussion about this. And to me, it kind of smacks a little bit of liberal racism, where you have people who want to be on the right side, but still can't quite give up that measure of, of, of white supremacy or mm -hmm. of superiority. They want to be in charge. They don't want any other people to be in charge, even though they have good intentions. Just trust us. Yeah. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it.